Good morning and welcome to another episode of Love and Daily. I'm Julian Bonici. Joining me today is Yannick Parch. We've got quite an action-packed um, list of stories for you today. The first is about uh, an Imjar farm owner after a hunter entered her property and shot her workers. The second is about the Nationalist Party who have been given 10 days by hackers um, or, or have sensitive data released. The third story is about controversy erupting over the choice of foreign dancers in Destiny's Eurovision performance. Um, the fourth is for football fans. It's about six major Premier Leagues withdrawing, um, withdrawing from the um, Euro European Super League. And the last one, a bit of international um, news with a super local context. It's about the police officer who met the George Floyd being found guilty of all charges. And some other just short news before we get started. Some positive news on the COVID um, numbers. We actually had 13 cases um, yesterday, one of the lowest we've had in all most a year and um, just remember to stay safe uh, and be vigilant for the time being it seems we're nearing at least um, uh, at the end um, at the end of, of the show we've got a special interview um, with my boss our boss really uh, Chris Perigin to speak about love and malt and sort of the five years um, it took to get here um, Jan on to our first story so uh, the owners of an Imjar farm said yesterday that the hunter had entered the property and shot at two of the workers uh, the owners of Vincent Seco farm in Imjar told love in Malta that this wasn't the first time that hunters had walked into their property and threatened employees. Um, the workers were only slightly injured in the incident but were reported to be um, shocked to the extent that for example some of them don't want to go to work. Uh, the police have been informed about the incident but unfortunately the perpetrators at this point have not yet been identified. Yeah, um, quite, a, quite a shocking story. I think it sort of um, harkens back to the whole debate, right, that we're having about private um, versus public um, land. Um, what I find um, quite funny in this case, right, so if, if me and you um, or anyone else watching, we're walking into the countryside and we entered into um, the land of, of a hunter or a farmer, I mean, we'd get a proper telling off that, uh, if just that, and the police will probably arrive on site immediately. It just seems that there are two weights and two measures um, for, for different kinds of people. Um, in the country, and I really think that's actually quite quite unfair. Hopefully, the police will catch the perpetrators sometime soon, and we can actually um, get some justice in that case. Um, on to our next story. It's straight out of a movie, but the PN has been given 240 hours or 10 days um, to contact hand hackers and pay a ransom or have a treasure trove of sensitive information, including employee salaries, financial data, personal details, payment documents, and so much more leaked online. The data is already online, but now they're threatening to actually make it completely available um, to anybody who requests from it. The hackers behind behind the hacker Avedon, they're, they're quite an infamous um, ransomware hacker group that have been active since February 2020. They target institutions, individuals and companies all across the globe and are actually proving um, pretty successful about it. Um, the PN so far has said that it's sort of not going to um, cooperate um, with the hackers and has actually contacted contacted the, the, the police commission, the commissioner for data protection to find an issue. Still, um, if they don't comply, the hackers have threatened to do a DOS attack um, on their website. Um, so, I don't know about you, yeah, but basically online I was actually seeing quite a lot of jokes about it. You know, the PN doesn't have any ransom, but what are they going to find? And all of this stuff. But I really want to make it clear actually how serious um, a leak like this is. At the end of the day, it is a, an opposi our opposition party. It is the second um, biggest party um, on, the, on the island. And an attack on them is in effect an attack on our democracy. Um, I'm really actually quite concerned, you know, that a day has passed and we haven't heard anything from the Labour Party or the government. Now I understand um, their rivals, you know, but it's really important to safeguard the democracy and a helpful reminder that this could actually um, also happen to them, you know. So I'm really hoping at least for some public statement and public support um, from the PM from our government. Quite a shocking case. I mean, it seems that uh, quite a bit of the information is already online. So that's, it's, uh, technically needs to be investigated even for, for the fact that a lot of people have already had uh, sensitive information um, leaked and, and, and dumped online, basically. Yeah, no, it's quite, quite worrying, quite worrying. Uh, on to our next story, Malta's choice of four foreign dancers to accompany Destiny at this year's Eurovision Song Contest in May has been met with a chorus of disapproval from many in the local art scene who have questioned if it was the case that Malta didn't believe in its local talent. Uh, many have pointed out that uh, Malta has a number of professionally trained uh, dancers uh, and they've also questioned why it was that uh, the dancers weren't selected following a public call or an audition. In fact, many have said, listen, I would have understood 
um, had there been an, an audition and uh, local dances were, were found not to be good enough. But uh, in this case, it just um, cast doubt on whether we actually believe in our, in our local artists. Um, so I might not have the most uh, popular opinion about this, and a lot of people um, out there might, might not like what, what I have to say, but you know, being Maltese isn't a God-given right um, to, perform, to perform on a stage. At the end of the day, um, Destiny's song itself is written by a bunch of foreigners, and I don't really see us uh, complaining, complaining uh, about that. There are also some practical realities, right, um, about a Eurovision performance. You know, oftentimes the creative directors are both from abroad because they simply um, have the expertise to do so, um, and rehearsals are just simply a lot more easier when you've got uh, foreign dancers, uh, you know, available over there in the area to actually um, help, help perform. Um, just on a, maybe a side note, because obviously there's maybe was some criticism that maybe certain Maltese dancers aren't professional enough and um, whatsoever. I'm not going to get into that because at the end of the day, every dancer has actually probably done quite a lot of hard work. I actually want to turn the attention maybe to government, right? I want to, what are like the arts council, the arts committees, the government doing to give proper funding to dancers, young artists to go abroad, train and actually become the experts uh, we need. Uh, on to our next story from dance all the way to sport. Um, plans for a Euper European Super League have been, have been are effectively going to be scrapped. They're in complete tatters just two days after the initial announcement. The initial announcement had created uh, effectively a civil war um, in the footballing world with the 12 teams um, um, stacking up against um, governing bodies and fans themselves. Um, six Premier Leagues were the first to announce, uh, to announce a, a U-turn and their intention to withdraw from the Super League. First it was Manchester City, then quickly followed by Chelsea, and now Liverpool, Arsenal, Man United and Spurs have followed suit. Um, most critics of the, of the proposal say it's just a crash grab, really, from the richest teams in the world, and it was going to completely stifle competition and the chance, at the end of the day, for underdogs, um, the Davids, really, to, to, be, to be the Goliaths. Um, the six Premier League teams aren't the only ones who are stepping away. There have been rumours and murmurs this morning that Inter, Inter Milan are also going to drop out. The only team that has sort of remained steadfast um, is Juventus. Um, uh, actually, Agnelli, um, the Juve president this morning, said, you know, football is not a game anymore, it's a, it's a business. Um, Unfortunately, I have to kind of agree with him slightly, right? I find it funny, you know, that a lot of football fans are complaining about how football has just become a business, just become a business. I didn't really hear people complaining when like 100 million, I think 200 million were being spent on players while a lot of people were struggling to make, make ends meet. Um, just one point, maybe on an international local sort of angle to it, um, Roberta Metzola um, actually weighed in on the subject on a BBC4 um, radio interview saying it was a slap in the face uh, for football fans and the European Parliament was even looking into antitrust and competition elements of the proposal. What do you think about it? Yeah? I mean, what surprises me is how, how these, these clubs that claim to have the supporters at the, at the very centre of, of, of what they do um, clearly didn't anticipate um, how they would react or hadn't even consulted or thought of them uh, before going ahead with these plans. Um, on to our final story, uh, the former Min Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who killed George Floyd, an, an African-American man, has been found guilty of all charges. Uh, Floyd, a 46-year-old man, was killed in May 2020 while being restrained by Chauvin after he was caught trying to buy cigarettes with fake banknotes. Uh, footage of the incident taken by passers-by showed the officer kneeling on Floyd's neck uh, for about nine minutes. Uh, the, incident, the, the incident resulted in protests across the US uh, and the world, uh, with the verdict being seen as a historic moment for the US, uh, which has seen uh, its fair share of, of, of police brutality, especially against the African-American community. In many cases, these, these incidents either go um, un well unpunished really is the case. <laughs> the, um, statistics show that the, the, the number of, 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 of these cases actually successfully prosecuted um, is, is, is very low yeah. and hopefully this can uh, mark a turning point um, for the U.S.'s police relationship with, with the African-American com African community. Yes, yeah, and I wish I could be a bit as optimistic as you. Um, as much as the guilty verdict is, is a really positive thing, I mean, I just want to point out that during this trial, um, three um, teenagers of color have all been gunned down by police officers during that period, so the issue is still very much alive. Um, just to bring the international story into a really local context, when I saw sort of um, Derek Chauvin being found guilty only 330 days 
um, of the initial crime, all it could make me think about is our really highly inefficient judicial system in Malta. I know they're completely different judicial systems, fair enough, but I would expect in a, in a country with, I think, maybe 1% of the population of America to, to actually, you know, um, have a, lo a lot more of an efficient system. So as I said, Derek Chauvin, the case was closed within 330 days, whereas in Malta, we're still waiting for justice for La Sana Cisse, and people like the De Georgias are still in the compilation of evidence, not even on trial. Jorg and Fennec, it's closing on to two years. And I mean, Love and Malta has covered this extensively. There are so many cases of people waiting decades to actually find justice. So I really hope the Justice Minister is looking at what's happening in America, from the, from the efficiency to the court sittings being aired live, take a note and implement them um, in Malta. Um, that's it just for now, for just a small, small break. We've got Chris Perigine um, coming up next for a short interview. And just a small, small reminder to always um, take a look at Love and Digest. That's our newsletter to keep um, in touch with all of our latest developing stories. Just a quick clip first. Hey guys, so today Love and Malta turns five and we've decided to mark the occasion by planting five trees for every year Love and has been around. So today we've come to Jnin Dom Mintov to plant 25 trees. Jnin Dom Mintov in Paula is one of the places in Malta and Gozo that takes best care of the trees and we know that Malta really, really needs some more trees. So here's our way of giving back to the community and saying thanks for being part of this success so far. So let's go and get planting. We're also adding a little message on the trees, which is that from the smallest seed, enormous trees grow. And that's a message to uh, remind us of how, how, how we started at Love in Malta, uh, from a very, very small team uh, in my living room <laughs> to uh, what we have today. You know, Love in Malta is a, a staple of the Maltese media. So yeah, that's our little message today. So that's 25 trees planted in Jnin Dom Mintov. That's five trees for every year Lavin has been around. And it's our commitment to plant another five trees every year until we're around. So just a little message of inspiration today. Uh, take care of your environment. If you get a chance to plant some trees, uh, we know Malta really needs it. So thanks for always following us and supporting us. And we'll see you next year for some more tree planting. Hi, welcome back. You just saw a, a, a quite an amazing video of, um, of our team um, planting five trees for a, a every year that um, we've been operational. That's a total of 25 trees, actually quite a, quite a really nice initiative. Um, with me now, I've got um, my boss, uh, really, Chris Perigine. Uh, hi, Chris. <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'll promise to be as hard hitting as possible. Um, so obviously yesterday um, you, we went, you planted um, some trees, you know, to commemorate Love and Malta's uh, fifth year anniversary, quite a really nice initiative. I just wanted to know, so obviously I've only been here two and a half years, three years maybe. Um, what is it like starting out Love and Malta? What was the idea behind it? Yeah, so, so yesterday was nice to, to celebrate five years of, of loving. Um, we, like you said, we, we planted these five trees and we also made a commitment that we'll be doing that every year uh, for, for, the, for the rest of our existence, hopefully. Uh, we know that Malta definitely needs more, <laughs> more trees. And I guess five years ago, the idea was that Malta needed more media, right? It needed more uh, voices in the, in the journalistic sphere. Uh, we started out wanting to kind of create a bit more light in what is what is essentially quite a, a, a dark new cycle, what tends to be quite a dark new cycle, right? We wanted to do things a little bit differently, have a bit more fun with it. Uh, I don't know, listicles, videos, you know, all of food, celebrity gossip. Uh, the truth is that in these five years, we've been sort of forced to get very serious, right? And that's partly because of all the very dramatic events that have happened in Malta. Um, over the past five years, but um, what what we I think what's what's really nice is that we have managed to to build this this platform. You know, uh, we've managed to recruit people like you as well <laughs> from uh, and, and and many others. Uh, many people have worked for Love in Malta in the past uh, five years, and yeah, it's been it's been a journey. Let's put it this way. Yeah, so it's been a journey, right? So five years. Are there any sort of major changes you've seen um, from a media aspect, from maybe a, a multi-societal aspect over the period? 
Yeah, I think society changed dramatically, right? I think uh, having a, a younger, more liberal voice in the media sphere has also meant that a lot of uh, issues that previously didn't get too much support or didn't get too much uh, attention uh, suddenly did get that support and attention. Uh, and I think that's uh, coincided with a lot of uh, reforms and changes Malta has seen. Uh, also, uh, activism, right, as in, again, providing a platform to so many, a very engaging platform to so many uh, young activists and, and, and hardworking, you know, campaigners, uh, has also, I, I think, given them more motivation to, to participate in civil society. So I think a lot of changes and it's, it's very rewarding to see those changes taking place, even though there's obviously a lot of things that still need to be changed about the country. <laughs> Okay, just to move on, um, okay, besides hiring me, um, what were your most memorable moments um, at Love and Malt over the five years? Yeah, look, I think uh, every day comes with uh, lots of different uh, news items and, and, and things. We've done some uh, very fun stunts, you know, our latest one uh, on April Fool's when we set up a, <laughs> a cannabis social club, but also our first one when we set up a, a political party for a day and actually registered as a political party. But I think the thing that really sticks out is um, you know, after, after spending a couple of years building a newsroom from scratch and trying to finance that through, through hard work and f with advertising and things like that, seeing it all come together and come to fruition when the country needed us most, which was when um, there was a lot of unrest in Malta, there were the, the, you know, Daphne had been killed, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was all the, court case, all the court cases, all the investigations, and everything kind of come, came to a head between 2019 and 2020, and it was very rewarding to see all of our team uh, keeping the public informed, whether it was live coverage during the protests, whether it was really good analysis, whether it was the, the new stories, whether it was Jürgen Fenech's actual escape, which, which you know, you broke um, on, on, on the day. So, you know, that, I think that was a, a really rewarding experience, seeing it all come together when, when the country needs us most. And now harder, what were the biggest challenges you faced over the five years? I think the, the challenges, you know, it's easy to say the, the challenges are, I don't know, financial or when we, we lost a lot of money during the <laughs> Love and Music Awards. Um, but I, I think really the, the challenge is in um, recruiting and retaining uh, staff, you know, in, in, uh, especially journalists um, and videographers, you know, at a, at a time when it's quite, it tends to be quite scary to be a journalist, you know, we've had some very dramatic um, reasons to, to worry about our safety. Um, and, and I think, you know, my, my challenge is creating a, an atmosphere where journalists can be paid well, can be motivated every day, can feel safe and secure in their job and can feel uh, fearless in, in, in expressing themselves and in doing what's, what's right, you know. That's been a, been a challenge, but it's been, uh, you know, <laughs> something we, we work on every day. So, um, at least speaking personally, one thing I always really loved about um, Love & Malta is that you were the great disruptor, right, in the media landscape. You really sort of changed it um, completely, right? And I know there are so many people out there who sort of think change is impossible, you can't disrupt anything. Like, what, what sort of message do you have for those people, you know, who feel nothing is being done? Yeah, it, it, the truth is the opposite of that, right? Change is, is always happening, it, it, it never stops. And, and it's, it's not that difficult to disrupt something, it's just about kind of identifying what's wrong about it and, 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 and what the demand is and trying to, to fix that. And that's what we um, set out to do five years ago. And it's what we continue to do, right? As in, uh, we, we see change every day, small changes, which we, we tend to forget is, uh, uh, we tend to forget is things are actually changing and things are actually happening, but every story we write has an impact. Um, and there are many moments where we go beyond the story as well. I mean, we, we can't forget the court case that we're, the court case that we filed, you know, which is crowdfunded by the public, um, which is to kind of get the courts to, to decide whether or not the, the concept of political party TV stations is uh, constitutional, right? Um, and that is uh, a major game changer, even just in terms of the, the discussion that we've triggered in the country, which is a discussion that's been going on for 30 years, but now is sort of grounded in the, 
uh, reality that something could change. Uh, and, and my advice to anyone who wants to disrupt any, any industry or, or do anything really, it's to um, do what you love, uh, ideally do what you know as well, you know, it's very good to have the experience, you know, I had journalism experience, I had PR experience, so I was quite uh, aware of the industry and what, what it needed. Uh, and I think if you if you do know your industry, if you do know what what it needs, and you're ready to put in the hard work, you you need to make sure it's something you love because if it's not, the hard work will uh, will get boring. So 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 don't uh, don't follow the money, uh, follow your heart and your passion. So um, I read actually quite an interesting opinion piece by you um, on on our 50th anniversary. It's sort of tied into this topic. But what what do you think? is the big next disruption on the island, or the, the disruption the island desperately needs. Yeah, so yesterday I published a piece about uh, this, right, which is what is the, the next big disruption we need. And I think uh, it was inspired by the fact that Malta is currently undergoing a massive reform. Um, since Robert Abela became prime minister and since a lot of the, the moneyval pressures have, have started to come to a head, uh, Malta has been investing heavily in institutions to start making them work. Uh, and we're already seeing some of the, the results of that. Now, my fear is that there are two institutions that are still being left out of this reform. Uh, political parties, which are an institution and need to operate like political parties and be free to do so. And the media, which is another institution and which is also facing the... Um, the added pressures and burdens of operating in a country that is, um, we, we cannot deny, uh, is, is so rife with, with financial crimes and, and, and corruption and things like that. So the workload of, of journalists and of media houses and of political parties has increased dramatically. But the, the funding and the resources haven't when we need them to. Uh, now, I don't think it's the state that should necessarily fund, you know, uh, political parties or, um, or the media, because that kind of creates some, some sort of problems with the, with the autonomy of these institutions. But there are things we can do. So, so I suggested uh, three things in my, in my opinion piece. One was uh, uh, government advertising needs to be properly regulated. We, we know what's happening with the Carmelo Abela case and with the Facebook spending, but more than that, Advertising is uh, uh, it, advertising spent by our taxpayer money is often used as a carrot and a stick against media organisations, and instead there should be a transparent, quite formulaic, you know, uh, way of, of 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 spending that money and done done through through proper rules. And if it is done in that way, then uh, the media can can uh, be be bolstered in that way, right? Because they, there's more guarantee of, of, you know, more transparency, more accountability of how that money is being spent. Uh, that's, that's one idea. The other thing was um, that uh, TVM, uh, Public Broadcasting Services, needs to be reformed, right? When we launched the case uh, about the, the party stations, one of the major criticisms was you know, the problem lies with PBS. And we tried to look into this, this concept of, of PBS and what's wrong with it. We asked a number of, for example, freedom of information questions about the financial situation because PBS is financed by the taxpayer to the tune of 6 million euros a year. It competes very aggressively in the advertising market and gets at least 3 million euros of advertising a year. And yet, it loses 10 million euros. <laughs> so there's something really pro problematic there. And when we asked questions uh, through freedom of information requests, we understood what the problem is. Um, because of the commercial aspect of PBS, PBS gets away without accountability. It says, you know, I can't explain how I'm spending this money because that's commercially sensitive. Whereas if PBS were completely state-funded, um, probably there would be more accountability, more transparency and better management, which would result in probably a net saving of the taxpayer uh, for the citizen. And the, the third point related to the party stations is that um, if TVM were to be completely state-funded and it can provide space to the parties to produce their, uh, their media content, um, their programs to get their message out, you know, so that they have a voice and they have a platform, then they can stop uh, selling advertising, you know, and, 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 and uh, linking with big business uh, in, in, in this way, becoming, selling their souls to big business because that's what, what happens and circumventing fin party financing rules. 
And if that's done, then what you have is the parties focused on being parties and doing their job as parties. PBS accountable to provide a, a proper public uh, broadcast and the media will will be operating in a more uh, fair way, you know, without the without having to compete with the state, the, the the party in government and the party in opposition. And I think that way, these two institutions that have been largely left out of this very big uh, reform process will also be reformed, which I think is a, a major thing for Malta because uh, we know that we need political parties and media outlets more than ever after the experience of these <laughs> five years. Sorry, I went on a... No, no, it was, it was <laughs> really interesting and I think you really explained it well, you know, about the changes. We actually genuinely do need um, in this country. Let us know whether you agree with Chris or not in the comments below. I think it's a really interesting debate um, for the future of Malta. That's it from us for today. Just a reminder to check out Love and Digest. That's our newsletter of our top stories of the day um, and have a day full of loving.